Hello students, in front of you is your lecturer CP and Dr. Nyaga Jage, continuing with your unit BAF 3201, Investment Analysis and Portfolio Management. A very vital unit for students who, is, who are undertaking finance because it guides them on how to invest and how to manage the India investment. But before I go to the subtopic of the unit, allow me to start with an adage used by Warren Buffett, that is why diversification is only required when investors do not understand what they are doing. What does this adage try to magnify? It is just trying to tell an investor, you don't need to invest in the bank, in the education industry, in hotel industry, in tourism industry, or any other industries which are available to you. No, 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 no. You just need to focus on few, and that implies you have to understand. And when you understand is when you know, if at all I put my money this way, it will bring me a return. If I put my money this way, it will not bring any return. Guided by what we call the risk return trade-off. Having done that, let's go to our subtopic of today, which is capital asset price model. Do remember I said, before you come to capital asset price model, I named it in the portfolio theory, I said, you cannot talk about capital asset price model before you analyze the portfolio theory. So these are scholars who took over from the development of a portfolio theory and they brought in their own thinkings, which are also supported academically. The CAPEM was developed by a guy called Sharp and he took over from the developer of the portfolio theory, uh, if you remember the name, he is uh, Ari Markowitz. Ari Markowitz, do you remember we said, he, is, he was the only son of a couple and being the only son, he developed a very funny theory, which tries to, 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 to magnify that two is better than one. And he went ahead to talk about the clever person and the wise person, in the sense that the wise person says, don't put your eggs in one basket. However, a clever person says, put your eggs in one basket and then start watching them. You don't need to watch them. Why can't you put them differently and then you relax? If you are taking a soda, you take without being uh, disturbed by any other issue. So the scholars of later days developed what we call the, the capital asset pricing model. And what about this capital asset pricing model? Unlike the portfolio theory, which unrest the total, exposure, the total risk exposure, the CAPM says, you don't need to address the total risk exposure. You should be able to narrow down to what we normally call specific risk. The portfolio theory said the, the total business risk or total risk exposure as far as an asset is concerned can be divided into two systematic and unsystematic. The systematic risk cuts across all the industries irrespective of the sector of operation. And these factors are kind of inflation, currency fluctuations, interest rate fluctuations, to name but a few, political wars and others. Those ones cannot be eliminated sorry, because they are not within the control of the manager. The manager cannot do anything with inflation which starts from America. You have to, 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 to do something uh, to, to allow it to take place so long as it doesn't injure your business to a big extent. However, an systematic risk comes from the internal attributes of a business. And if they are internal, it implies that the manager can do what? Can manage them or even eliminate them in total. For instance, if a business has employed and qualified personnel, what do you expect from unqualified personnel? It is low productivity or sub, 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 some, some quality 
in terms of the produce or service. Can it be employed? Can it be improved? Yes, it can be improved. If at all you, call, you employ qualified personnel, the sub, sub, substandard product or services will not be encountered. So the better you are. Okay, so the CAPM model says we don't need to factor, when analyzing the return and the risk of a portfolio, we don't need to factor in the risk which can be eliminated. So they just narrowed down to what we call systematic risk. And this systematic risk, instead of them measuring it by the use of standard deviation as used in the portfolio theory, they said the measure of the systematic risk should be what we call a beta factor, a beta factor indicated like that, like this one, a beta factor. So the CAPM works under the assumption that a systematic risk can be eliminated. And therefore, the focus of the financial analyst should be systematic risk. By that assumption, the model brought up the framework for measuring systematic risk of an individual security and relating it to systematic risk of a well-diversified portfolio. If we can continue, the CAPM or the capital asset pricing model measures the risk of a given stock relative to the market forces. And according to it, they said, assuming a security I, the beta factor will be beta I, which mathematically is given by COV in bracket, stock, comma, market, everything divided by VAR, bracket, market, bracket. What was those abbreviations mean? COV is the relationship between the return of two securities making the portfolio. How do they, the, the two behave? The variant, the VAR is the variance. Although in a layman language, we can say the volatility. How do the return of a market security behave when the market factors start reacting? For instance, if at all there is a high inflation, how will the return of a market security behave? So, uh, noting that the cap M borrowed from the portfolio theory, we move to say, remember, for security A and B, the COV was given by a correlation coefficient between A and B, product of the standard deviation of A, product of standard deviation of B. Given that, we can now borrow from the portfolio theory and map it in the cap M equation by saying the COV IM, COV IM is equal to correlation coefficient between I and M, product of standard deviation of I and the standard deviation of M, divided by VAR of the market. If you check all from the brief charts here, I can illustrate as follows. Thus, COV IM is equal to the row of I M multiplied by delta I delta M divided by var of the market. Do remember the variance is nothing but standard deviation multiplied by itself. So we can go down to say that it is correlation coefficient which is rho I M multiplied by delta I product of delta M divided by delta M product of delta M. And this delta M by delta M becomes the variance. If you check from the simple mathematics, it implies that this one and this one will cancel. And by cancellation, you are going to be left with I M product of delta I divided by delta M. If we rearrange 
in a more econometric way, we can say it is equal to delta, uh, delta, delta high, sorry, all over delta m product of the raw or localization coefficient of what? I and what? And m. And this becomes now the cov of all that, which is now but nothing but a measure of the of the vector. Having tackled that, we go to what we normally call security market line. Do remember in the portfolio theory we had a capital market line, but now we are talking about security market line, which is somehow similar. So the cap M led to the development of SML. And what is this SML? It is a line which shows the relationship or the trade-off between risk and return of a well-diversified portfolio. And what do we mean by a well-diversified portfolio? A well-diversified portfolio is that portfolio whereby the unsystematic risk has totally been eliminated. And by eliminating uh, unsystematic risk, we are only left with what? Systematic risk. If we move on, the graphical representation of SML is as shown below. There is the, the vertical line, there is a horizontal line, and the horizontal line is what we normally call independent line or tackling the independent variable. While the, or the, the what the vertical line and raises what we call dependent variable, and from this one, if you remember the, the the simple mathematics, we normally say the dependent variable is function of independent variables. As initially stated, eh, the portfolio theory led to the development of what we call capital market line or CML. The CAPM or the CAPM led to development of a special line called SML. And the graphical representation of SML can be seen from this point. Here we have what we call independent variable, which is the beta P. We have in independent variable which is ERP, it should be ERP. Then at this point here, we are saying it is expected return of a market security, which is we said it is hypothetical. Then we have return of a market security or a portfolio, which is comprising of risk-free assets here. So the line which is coming from here up to this point is what we are calling SML, or simply security market line, which is fundamentally similar to what we call CML. And having seen how it behaves graphically, it is always good to know how to drive it mathematically. And there are three steps underlying derivation of SML. Using two coordinates on the line work for the slope of the line. We have talked about one E into brackets RIM, brackets and bracket zero RF. And if at all you work for the gradient or the slope, do you remember uh, in mathematics we normally say gradient is equal to change in vertical change divided by the horizontal change. And that is what has been done here. On simplification, we have got E in brackets RIM minus RF. And this is equation number one. In equation number two, we have said using a general coordinate, BP, E, RP, and one of the coordinates already used, we now get an equation relating to the gradient of the same same line. And from mathematics also the, it has been got here, the vertical change divided by horizontal change, which is giving us E in brackets RP minus RF divided by the vector P, which is now equation number two. Okay. Equation number one as well as number two are relating to the same item, slope. So because we are talking, we are getting them from the same line, they should be the same. So we are supposed to equate equation one as well as equation two 
and simplify. And on simplifying, we make ERP the subject of the equation. And finally, we are going to get E in brackets, RP is equal to RF plus theta P in brackets, RM minus RF. And this is now what we are calling SML equation. Allow me to illustrate mathematically by use of the flip chip. That's here, we come here. Here we have beta p. Here we have E R P. Here we have E R M, the same way it was. Here we have R F. And then we have our line here, which is we are calling S M L. If we extrapolate here, it comes here, it goes here, and this is now the beta of m, which is always 1 as far as cap m is concerned. And now we want to get the mathematical equation. We, we, we go to the step number 1, as we said. Pick two coordinates on this line, and then work for the gradient. So I will pick this, there is this point here, which is on the line, and the other one on the line. What is the coordinate here? This is now 1, then E, R, M. This is one of the coordinates of the line. The other one is what? This is 0. So this is 0, R, what? R, F. And given these two coordinates, it implies that we can work for the what? For the gradient. And this is what we are saying. Slope is given by Vertical change divided by what? Horizontal change, which is given by what? Let us see the vertical variables. The vertical variables is this one and this one. So we can start from here, moving here, or from here, moving here. So we can move from here. We can say it is E R M minus what? R half divided by 1 minus 0. If you simplify that, what are you going to get? You're going to get E R M minus R F. And this is what we are calling number one. What about number number two? The same case here. Uh, these are what we are calling now the general coordinates. If you bring these two, it's going to give you the general coordinates. That's what we say beta P E R P and one of the coordinates which we have already used. We can either use this one or this one. But for simplicity, it is wise always to do to use the one which is looks a bit simple. So I can use zero R F. Having got that, I can move. I can move and get the slope using the same. It was what? Slope slope is, is also given by the same thing, vertical, divided by what? Horizontal. But we have seen there is what we call ERP, ERP minus what? RF from the coordinate which I have already uh, got, divided by what? The beta P, beta P minus what? Minus zero. Which gives you E RP minus RF or over beta P, which we are calling equation 2. And we have said 1 and 2 are the what? Are the same. So we can say that, therefore, but what? 1 is equal to 2. Therefore, we can say that E R what? RM minus RF is nothing but equal to what? E R what? R P minus R F divided by what? By beta P. Do remember, we are saying we make E R P the what? The subject of the equation. Which demands you multiply, we multiply every number here on this side as well as that side by what? By beta P. So we can say E R M minus R what? 
RF multiplied by beta P is nothing but E RP minus RF. If I to multiply beta P times beta P here, it goes. But this one will come on the other side. It will be if I we rearrange beta for this multiplier to be in front, it becomes beta P in brackets E RM minus RF, which is equal to which is equal to E RP minus R F. We want this one to be on one side. So we can take mathematically we can take R F on the other side. Or we can say add R F on each of the side. So we can say that is beta P multiplied by E R M minus R F. Now this one comes on this side. It becomes positive. R F is equal to E R P. Okay? We can rearrange this equation in a better way. We can say all E R P is nothing but beta P multiplied by E R M minus R F in brackets plus R F R F. And this is now what we are calling what? This is what we are calling S M L equation. Step by step, without much confusion. It is not cast on stone on which coordinates should you start with, so long as you are mathematically correct and you, you take care of addition, subtraction, multiplication and division, you are bound to get this final equation. And this is what we call SML equation, put in a mathematical way. Even though still we can rearrange it to become econometric equation by starting with what? R half, and it will be same equation. If we move, do remember in the portfolio theory, we had CML, but now in the cap M, we are talking about SML. What is the difference between the two? If we move to our proof charts, we can appreciate the variables which have been used. For instance, here in the, in the CML, we had ERP, which is still here in the SML. But when we come to the horizontal line here, in the CML, we had a standard deviation. But now we have beta, beta factor. So the first difference is simply this, thus, the SML measures risk by the use of beta factor, while CML measures risk in terms of what? Standard deviation. Do remember standard deviation was measuring the aggregation between systematic risk and unsystematic risk. More to that, in the portfolio theory which came up with the CML, the two of them talked about the market what? Market security or market portfolio, which is hypothetical. Here, also in SML, we have the market portfolio, which is hypothetical. However, when we come here, the measurement of the risk of a market security, here it is one, the beta factor is one. But when you go to CML, the standard deviation was not one. So that's where we are going to get the second difference by saying that, SML line uses the portfolio, Max, sorry, uses the market portfolio whose beta factor is equal to one. Whereas the CML uses market portfolio whose standard deviation is never one. So the assumption which is very strong as far as CAP M is concerned is that the market portfolio should have a beta factor of one. Having done that, now having known or now to work for a beta factor of a security, and these securities are forming a portfolio, it is wise for us to ask ourselves how do we get 
a risk measure of a portfolio by the use of a beta factor. And if you check here, we can say the beta factor, which is now a beta of a portfolio, is nothing but the sum of weighted beta factors of assets or of securities making the portfolio. Thus, let portfolio P comprise of assets or of securities 1, 2, 3, up to N. And from computations, we realize that we can compute the beta factor of each of the assets in the portfolio. And this is what we are calling beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, up to N. So then it implies that we can do what? We can get the risk of a portfolio by the use of the beta factor, which is nothing but equal to W1, W, W1 beta 1 plus W2 beta 2 plus moving on up to the last asset, which is WN beta N. Allow me to illustrate by what we are saying in that formula, in that computation, if at all I can illustrate. Let's have a portfolio P to represent a portfolio. This portfolio is, is having three assets. That is A, B, and C. Okay. These three of them have been brought together to make a portfolio P. The question which we are supposed to ask ourselves, what is what? What is the beta of A? Give it two. What is the beta of B? Give it four. What is the beta of what? Uh, allow me to change. Make, let me make this one 0 0.2. This one, 0 0.4. And what is the beta of C? Which is, uh, I can say, 0 0.8. Okay, having got the beta factors, then we go ahead. What is W, W, A? What is the proportion of A in that portfolio? Let us have it to be kind of 20%. That is the 20% of P is, is A. Then what about WB? Make it 50%. If you check here, 20 plus 15 becomes what? 70, which implies the balance to make 100% is 30. So we can argue that the WC is 30%. Having been given all those information, it implies then we can use our equation to work for the what? The beta factor of our what? Of our portfolio. Thus, beta P. Beta P. And this P is A plus B plus C should be equal to W A beta A plus W B beta B plus W C beta C. Which is equal to, if I told you take, first of all is, W A is 20%. We multiply by what? By 0 0.2 plus for B, W B is 50%. We multiply by 0 0.4 plus W C is that a percent. We multiply by 0 0.8. Okay. Which is purely 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 plus 0 0.5 times 0 0.4 plus 0 0.3 times 0 0.8. Okay, which becomes 0 0.04 plus 0 0.02 plus 0 0.24. If we had all these, 0 0.04 plus 0 0.02 becomes 0 0.6. 0 0.6 plus 0 0.24 becomes 0 0.3. And that is going to give us the beta factor 
of a portfolio which is comprising of asset A, asset B, and asset C. Okay, having done that, there is need to interpret this value of beta, whether it is this one, whether it is this one, whether it is this one, all for the portfolio itself, are bound to be interpreted by the financial analyst. And how is the interpretation? Do remember we said the benchmark is what we call the market security, which is hypothetical. We relate everything to the behavior of the market security. And that, if that is the case then, we have to be asking ourselves, if the beta factor of a portfolio is kind of 0 0.3 and that of a market portfolio is 1, what about it? Guided by our values, the interpretation of the beta factors is follows. Number one, if a beta factor of a security is greater than one, then that security is said to be more sensitive to systematic risk factors. Those are external factors which cannot be controlled by the manager than the market security. If there is inflation, the return of that security is going to react. It can react positively or negatively. It depends. If there is politics which are beyond the control of the manager, the return of that security is going to be highly volatile. It will be, key, it will be changing now and then in a manner that it becomes unpredictable. The security with that kind of uh, behavior is what we normally call aggressive security. If we go to number two, a security with a beta factor less than one, for instance now we have got this one and all the securities which I have given here, they are having a beta factor less than one, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8 is less than one. What about them? Such security is less sensitive to systematic risk factors than the market security. And such security is called defensive security. That is, it is able to control itself within the happenings of what we call external factors, which cannot be controlled by the management. That security, that investment is able to contain itself. It will not be highly volatile. And even from the word defensive, it is so clear that it is able to defend itself to external forces. Then lastly, a security with a beta factor which is equal to zero can be said to be defensive, neither defensive or aggressive. And such security is what we normally call risk-free securities. As much as we may not give specific examples of what we call aggressive securities as well as defensive securities. Risk-free securities are very much within us in terms of government. If at all you invest with the government in terms of treasury bonds and treasury bills, you are said to have invested in a risk-free security. Not that really they are free, because we have realized the turmoil is happening in Kenya, the poverty, the warm politics, and what have you. Or what we are trying to say is that if at all you invest in those kind of securities, you are bound to be paid. But it may take 20 years to be paid. It may take whatever years. If at all you are lucky enough, you will be paid within the shortest time possible. But you are bound to be paid. But for the aggressive security, as well as defensive security, it is not a must than you get a return. You can get a new return. Do remember, we normally say, the payment of a return in most of the investment uh, areas, in particular shares, it is within the board of directors. If at all the board of directors have said there will be no return to that investor this time, then you don't have anything to do. You're just going to relax and say, maybe next year, things will be okay. 
And because of that, you cannot influence the return from the aggressive as well as defensive. And that's the reason why we cannot pinpoint an example to it. Today it may be Safaricom. Next year it might be Equity Bank. Next year but one, it might be a case in B, investment. But do remember it can still keep on this year it is aggressive. Next year it is defensive depending on the external factors as it relates to what we are calling the market security. Having come to that level, we have come to the end of our lecture and I will request you to read on advantages and disadvantages of CAPM. Do remember the advantages as well as disadvantages are essentially known when you, you critically understand, you critically understand the content of what is being addressed or what is being taught. And the, mo and the moment you are able to do that, you will be able to identify disadvantage as well as advantage. And the next lecture lesson will be on the application of the CAPM. We come to the end of our lecture. Thank you.